I've previously done cross-sectional surveys of the first wave long haulers at the 6, 12 and 18 month marks. Now that we've clocked two years with the condition, I thought it was worth following up and seeing how we're all getting on. I just want to start with a quick word on my most recent film. It caused quite the stir on social media, especially amongst those in the MECFS community who have unbelievably experienced decades of gaslighting from the biopsychosocial lobby and the doctors they've influenced. I just want to be clear on my position regarding the possible role of prior trauma in some people who go on to develop long COVID. I've been very clear on this channel that there is nothing psychological about the pathology in long COVID and the BPS lobby and the psychologization of disease has been a travesty that has done untold harm. The last film was discussing how trauma has a physiological effect on the body and the autonomic system and a body that's in sympathetic overdrive will have consequential effects on behavior and when stuck in fight or flight over a long period of time we can thus see that as personality. That behavior that is. I know previous studies have been inconclusive with this link and MECFS, but the empirical evidence and anecdotal stories around what we see around us in long COVID is, uh, well, they're interesting enough to me to merit the discussion um, explicitly around the physiological rather than the psychological impact. There's a lot of good published work on trauma and the effects on the autonomic system, and if you're interested, I urge you to check it out. Right, let's get on with the matter in hand and the two-year recovery survey. We had 1,436 respondents, 68% of whom became ill in March 2020. Who were this cohort? Uh, well, they were 80% women, mostly between 35 and 54, mostly from the UK, but also the United States, Europe, Scandinavia and Canada. The majority of them didn't complete the previous 18-month survey, and because this data is anonymous, I can't directly compare the two sets of data. It's essentially a snapshot of the long-hauler community right now. So how healthy were these folk before COVID came along? Well, the answer is extremely. Uh, when asked to rate their previous health on a score of 1 to 10, the modal average was 9. And how about now? Uh, well, here's a, a concrete indication of just how debilitating the condition is. Uh, two years in, the modal average is down to three out of 10. And this is a scale where one out of 10 is the worst health you can possibly imagine. Uh, for reference, I answered nine on the first scale and five on this one in terms of my own level of health right now. Um, so let's look at people's subjective feelings about the last six months. Are they getting better? Uh, the yellow group here is those who feel about the same, uh, while the green and purple are slightly or much better uh, versus the red and blue or of slightly or much worse. Uh, green and purple both bigger than red and blue respectively, so that's a good sign. Although this particular chart is less encouraging than the one we saw at 18 months. One confounding factor that should be taken into account in this particular snapshot is the role of Omicron infection, which has ripped through Western societies in the last few months. Um, a quarter of this group have tested positive, whilst another significant proportion felt like they had had an infection. Uh, this reflects the anecdotal trend that lots of people had infected people in their household, they had symptoms themselves, but never tested positive. So are these fake negatives or an abortive infection triggering a relapse? It's unfortunately hard to know. Uh, for those who are now a month out from their Omicron infection, if they had one, uh, let's look at what impact it's had on their baseline of symptoms. Well, unfortunately, the answer here is not good. Uh, look at the red and blue of slightly and much worse versus the green and purple of slightly and much better. However, over half of this group do appear to have at least got back to their baseline, which is encouraging. Uh, let's look at the whole group again uh, and which symptoms are improving the most. Number one, fatigue. Uh, number two, breathlessness. Number three, tachycardia, palpitations and heart issues. Also note the size of the group reporting that no symptoms have improved. Um, how about which symptoms have got worse? Well, out in front this time, neurological. That includes brain fog, which is a bit reductive and I'm sort of moving towards calling it cognitive dysfunction instead. Um, and then fatigue. Uh, this is always one of the most illuminating questions uh, coming up next. How many of this cohort have been able to go back to work? 
Well, a distressing 82 long haulers in this sample have lost their job as a direct result of long COVID. And 29% of the whole group are not able to work at all. 24% uh, can work at a much reduced level. 7% are in the process of a staggered return to work. 16% are back at work full time, but feel like they're compromising their recovery in the process. And only 7% are back at work with no ill effects. It is unfortunately a pretty similar chart to the one at 18 months. And if we remove those for whom the question wasn't applicable because they weren't in work before, uh, then we can see that 92% of these first waivers are now unable to work as they could before their first COVID infection, which is pretty staggering two years on. Uh, now, this is the point at which I do have to bring up one of the selection biases in this data. It is possible or even likely that people who have recovered completely are less likely to frequent the support groups and social media platforms where this survey was shared and less likely to be motivated to complete it. So we may be seeing a somewhat incomplete picture. Uh, the 18 month survey, for example, got 2,250 responses, 800 more than this one. Does that mean that all of those 800 people have now recovered and are off merrily living their lives? I'd certainly like to hope so. We did, however, get around 100 respondents uh, who did feel that they had recovered. The most common month they turned the corner, well, month 18, uh, followed by the two year mark. The majority of this group felt they'd made a change or there had been one particular factor that had catalyzed their recovery. What was it? Well, number one, good old father time. No question, no matter what else you do, this is a huge, huge factor. Number two was pacing um, of absolutely critical importance. Uh, next were supplements, diet management and medication. I asked this group what the one piece of advice would be uh, they would give to those who have yet to turn the corner. Now obviously these are all qualitative answers but I aggregated the sentiments and they came out as the following. Number one, rest. Two, pace. Three, be patient, give it time. Four, don't push yourself. Now this might seem like a particularly passive list when we're all dying to do something active to aid in our recovery, to speed it up and make it happen now. But don't underestimate how difficult it is to do these particular passive actions well, when life and its demands have a habit of getting in the way. Uh, it's an excellent reminder for all of us though, um, when the people who have recovered say these are the things that were most important in their recovery. Some final notes on this survey, my standard research disclaimers, uh, respondents came from social media platforms including Twitter and Facebook, and as well as the selection bias uh, that might exclude recovered people, there's also a demographic skew that will come from this nature of recruitment. One final useful thought, um, what if we didn't just have cross-sectional data, but actually paired results across a longer period? Well, back in January 2021, uh, I helped the University of Bonn with a study looking at immune subsets from blood samples of long haulers. We had a small cohort of 21 people and we asked them to rate their current health out of 10 at the time of the blood samples back in January 2021. I followed up with this group 16 months later to ask the same question again and I got 18 out of the 21 people to, uh, to come back to me. So first of all, how healthy were they pre-COVID? And it's a pretty healthy bunch as you can see here. How were they doing uh, in January 2021? Well, not great. And how are they doing now? Well, if you look at this, generally speaking, better, uh, quite a bit in some cases. And uh, just to try and get a little bit fancy on it, um, I did a paired t-test using their original scores out of 10 rather than the retcon ones that were shown in this survey. And what did it show? Um, well, a p-value of 0 0.0003, indicating an extremely statistically significant result. That is to say, amongst this small sample of long haulers originally affected in 2020, some degree of recovery does appear to be happening. In summary then, what's the status at two years? Generally speaking, it seems that most of those who were ill at six months are still suffering some degree of symptoms now, but on the whole, there is some degree of improvement. And of course, this doesn't mean that there isn't still a pressing need for viable, effective treatments, but it does show that 
patience is key, and managing your activity levels through your recovery is essential to avoid sending yourself back to PEM jail and potentially protracting your illness. Next up, following on from the interview I did with Dr. Tanya Dempsey about how women's menstrual cycles can play havoc with their long COVID symptoms, I've now got some really interesting data. So in the next one, I'm gonna be breaking that data down and looking at, uh, depending on when in the cycle these symptoms get worse, trying to see if it can tell us something about what might be going on with our immune response that's responsible for those symptoms. Till next time. <laughs>